Welcome. Uh, well, let's wait for another gadget. Is it recording? Yes, recording. So turn with me to John chapter 10. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. Uh, sometimes there's a lag between when uh, the operator turns on the record button. So if you're uh, watching this video and you'll see me saying, are we recording? Are we recording? We're actually recording. That's because I dropped the ball and I wasn't paying attention to the, the hand signals that my wife was making in the background. So turn with me to John chapter 10. We're going to read verse 22, and I'm going to glean an application uh, from this passage, from uh, a statement from this uh, verse. I'm going to apply it. Uh, it will, my application will not be entirely uh, doctrinally correct, uh, nor will I cause you to err doctrinally with the application that I will make, and you'll see soon what I mean by that. <clears throat> so turn with me to John chapter 10. We'll begin in verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. And I love what Jesus says. <laughs> you know what's going on here. So Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believed not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now, I believe John 10, 29 refers to the new birth, because I believe uh, the new birth is given to us by God, and this is the method by which God uses to give us to Christ. John 10, 30 says, I and my Father are one. Again, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. Of which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. They were going to stone him for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Notice what the discussion is going on here. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, Thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand, and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John had first baptized, and there he abode. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this, um, this message that you have given us, Lord, of this passage that is so deep uh, and so rich in theology, Lord God, uh, this passage, Father, that uh, clearly expresses uh, the deity of Christ and the identity of Christ, Lord God. We pray we do justice to this passage this morning, Father, and you open the hearts and the minds of your people, Lord God, to receive what you have for them, Lord God. That they may rejoice in the truth, and that they may rejoice that you have given them light and have opened their eyes and their hearts to receive you and to receive these blessed, uh, blessed truths from your word. Bless your people, Lord God. Bless those who are hearing this message. Do your work in their hearts. Soften our hearts, open our hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we just read here what is recorded in the book of John, I believe, is one of the tersest conversations that Christ had with the Jews. Now, uh, the term Jews uh, oftentimes is used in a, in a couple of different ways in the New Testament. Uh, it refers to the leaders of the children of Israel, are called Jews. It also refers to simply the Jewish people. In this, uh, it is evident from the passage that we just read that these Jews were frustrated with Jesus Christ. Have you ever gotten really frustrated with someone? 
that you're telling them something and, and it's not going through and you're getting frustrated because they're not understanding you. The Jews were frustrated with Christ. And what was their frustration? They were frustrated because they asked him and they said, Are you the Messiah? And if you are, tell us plainly. They were frustrated. They wanted to hear Jesus tell them whether he was the Messiah or not. Now let me ask you this. Was that really what they wanted to know? Now today, the question is still valid. Was Jesus Christ the Messiah or not? And now that, that question uh, is not only to be asked of the Jews today, but of every single man, woman, and child. Is Jesus Christ the Messiah? We will expound on this question uh, in, in not, we will not expound on this question in great detail this morning, but we will simply tell you, simply tell you what Jesus himself said to the Jews when he was asked this question. Now listen carefully to his response. When he was asked by the Jews, are you the Messiah? Listen to what he says. I told you, and ye believed me not. <laughs> I, just, I just find this funny. I mean, I told you guys, I am the Messiah. The problem is you don't believe me. Yeah. Many will quick, many will be quick to rebut and say, where in the Bible does it say that he's the Messiah? I'm glad you asked. In John, in John chapter 4, uh, John records a conversation that Jesus had with a woman at the well, with a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. Listen to a portion of the conversation. I'm not going to read the whole passage to you, but if you want, you can turn there. In John chapter 4, verse 25, the woman who was sitting by the well and is having a conversation with Jesus, not knowing who he is, she says this to him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. So this woman knows from what she's been taught by her parents and from the scriptures that the Messiah is going to come one day. And don't miss the reply that Jesus makes. In John 4, 26, Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. There you have it. How more plain can Jesus get? This woman asks when the Messiah comes, and Jesus says, it's me. Right here. I, I, I'm it. I'm the guy. Jesus basically told this woman that he was the Messiah. Therefore, you can come away with one of two conclusions. Jesus was truly the Messiah, or he was a big liar. Right? One of two conclusions that you can come up. There is no other position you can take. And during this exchange with the Jews, he makes it clear that he has told them that he was the Messiah. But instead of believing him, they picked up stones to stone him because of blasphemy. What was the blasphemy? That he said he was the Messiah. And right before he was crucified, Caiaphas, the high priest, asked Jesus the same question. Listen to this in Matthew 26, 63. But Jesus held his peace during the trial, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou, that thou tell us whether or not thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Again, how many times? Now, this is just a few of the, the Bible only records a few of the times that they asked him whether he's the Messiah or not. And listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, chapter 26, verse 64 and 65. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said. In other words, you said it. In other words, you testified that I am the Christ, the Son of God. Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What was the blasphemy that Jesus spake? He, he, he agreed with the high priest that he indeed was the Son of God. The high priest asked him, tell us, are you the Christ? Are you the Son of God? Jesus says, yes, I am. Blasphemy! And he rent his clothes and he says, what further need we have witnesses? Behold, now you have heard his blasphemy. What, what was the blasphemy? The blasphemy was that Jesus said that he was the Son of God, the Messiah. So either he was or he was a bald-faced liar. You tell me what, what it is. Now, oh, he was a good man. He was a prophet. He was a good teacher. 
How can he be a good man, a good teacher, a good prophet if he lied to you? So what's going on over here? Over and over the Jews asked him. Even the high priest asked him. They were asking Jesus, are you the Messiah? He never denied it. In fact, he told them he was. What was the problem? The problem was not in his answer. The problem was that they refused to believe in him. And this is the case with many today. You can tell them over and over again until you're blue in the face that Jesus was the Messiah, but they will refuse to believe you. Why? Because they don't want to believe it. It's that simple, my friends. It is not whether he was the Messiah or not. They simply refuse to believe it. I'm here based on the authority of the Word of God, and I tell you that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. You have two choices to make. Believe it or reject it. The choice is yours. Furthermore, Jesus tells them, tells the Jews and back in John chapter 10, why are you accusing me of blasphemy because I tell you I'm the Son of God? Did you not ask me if I am He? And He responded and He told them. They asked Him point blank, are you, why would they ask Him if He was or not? Because they saw all the miracles that He did. Raising people from the dead, healing the sick. Only someone from God can do such a thing. And when Caiaphas, the high priest, asked Jesus whether he was the Christ, he also added the phrase, the Son of God. The Jews knew from the Scriptures that the Messiah would be the Son of God. The book of Isaiah tells us this. And I'm here to tell you again on the authority of the Word of God that Jesus testified through his own mouth. He bore witness that he was Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. The problem with people is they do not want to believe it. It's not a matter of whether he was the Messiah or not. He was. He said he was. I believe he was. And by believing that he was the Messiah, he has given me the new birth, the new covenant that was prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah and the prophet Ezekiel, that the Spirit of God will come upon those who believe in him. I'm a partaker of this covenant. And many here today would testify of the same thing that I am testifying to you this morning. That the moment you receive Christ as your Savior, acknowledging that He was the Christ, when you say He was the Christ, you are saying that He was the Messiah, the one and the same. Didn't Caiaphas, the high priest, ask Jesus whether He was the Christ, the Son of God? Being Christ and being the Messiah is one and the same. And to, and to make things even more clear, uh, in John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus declares His deity. He says, I and my Father are one. What more can we say? What more can Jesus say? He was basically testifying that I am the Son of God. I am God in the flesh. And to prove his point, Jesus makes a statement to the Jews who were the leaders of Israel at that time. And he quotes Exodus chapter 22 verse 28. When he, when he says to them, ye are gods, he is basically quoting Exodus 2.28, which says, Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. How do we know that Jesus was quoting Exodus 2.28? Because Jesus makes it clear that the law of Moses calls those in authority gods. Thou shalt not revile the gods is not a reference to mocking demons, as I was taught when I was younger but a caution against speaking evil against the rulers that God has appointed of the people. These gods represented God and therefore had to be respected. Jesus makes the case and he says, if God called you guys gods, because the Jews that he was speaking to were the leaders of the people, then why are you offended that I cannot be God in the form of flesh? If those who hold a divinely appointed office can be considered gods, how much more can the one whom God has chosen and sent be called the Son of God? That's basically what he was telling. If you looked at Jesus, you would think he was just an average Joe. But he, more, he was more than that. He was God robed in human flesh. Now I want to show you something, and this is free. Uh, and this is why one of the proofs behind why I use the King James Bible. Only the King James Bible has Exodus 22, 28 translated correctly. You heard this here. Only the King James Bible has Exodus 22, 28 translated correctly. All of the Bibles have, or something similar to, that, to what I'm about to quote, 
Ye shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people. Why did they change the word gods to God? When you do that, you break the cross-reference of John 10.34. Be careful when you change the word of God. John 10.24 says, uh, John 10.34 says, I'm going to read it to you. Now, do not miss the words that Jesus uses here. I want you to uh, pay attention uh, carefully. In John 10.34, the Bible says, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? What law is he referring to? The law of Moses. He says, In the law of Moses, it's written, Ye are gods. Now, let me ask you this. Now, in the Greek, it's gods. Thei. No ambiguity here. Where in the law is it written that ye are gods? The only reference is Exodus 22, 28. So when you change the word from gods to God, thinking that, oh, how can they revile the gods? You change the cross-reference from John 10, 34. Be careful when you change the word of God. Even David quotes Exodus 22, 28. In Psalms 82, verse 6, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are the children of the Most High. Now, this gods is not referring to demons. It's referring to gods as in human rulers appointed by God to stand in his place. And I want to focus on the statement with the rest of the time that we have left this morning. But before I do, I want to read to you Psalms 82, verse 1 and 2. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. And these are not demons. These are gods uh, who are humans in position of authority. In verse 2, and God says, How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? God is saying that he's looking down upon the gods, a small g-o-d-s, and he's looking at them, and God is getting upset because they are not judging correctly. Now, you know the judges that we have in our society today, in a way, they are gods, small g-o-d-s, because they are judging, they are in the place of God, because when they pass judgment, they are in essence... In, in essence, acting on behalf of God. If you don't believe me, read Romans chapter 13. So it is clear from Scripture that the word gods sometimes refers to magistrates, rulers, judges, princes, and other people who hold positions of authority and who rule over God's people. Calling rulers gods indicates three things. One, that this person has authority over other people. Two, he, the power that he wields is to be feared. Romans chapter 13 again. If you doubt me. And three, he derives his power and authority from God himself, and therefore he is called a God, small g. The use of the word gods to refer to human beings is rare, but it is still used in the Old Testament. The most poignant example is the conversation that God is having with Moses regarding Pharaoh. In Exodus 7:1, God says unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be a prophet. So God has no problem saying he makes men a god, small g. Now, if you remember the context, in ancient Egypt, uh, they were pagans, and they held to the belief that Pharaoh was the god Ra reincarnated in the flesh. And many pharaohs believed that they were, in fact, Ra reincarnated in the flesh. They were the top god in the land. And they believed, the ancient Egyptians believed, that they had to appease all the gods so that their wives could bear children, that the crops could produce, and the rains would come in due season, and so on, so forth and so on. They believed if they didn't appease the gods, it would not go well with them. They had a god for everything. And, they, and, and some gods were more powerful than others. And Pharaoh, again, was the highest god in the land. So this is the context why God says to Moses, I will make you a god unto Pharaoh. So when Pharaoh sees you, he will think that you are a god. And that is the case. Though Moses was not a god, to the pagan Pharaoh he was a god. It was only in Pharaoh's eyes that Moses was considered divine because of the miracles that he did. Only a god can do such things that Moses did. Moses was seen a rival in Pharaoh's eyes. Who is going to be the God of this land? Is it going to be Moses? Is Moses going to be the God? Or is Pharaoh going to be the God? 
But Pharaoh figured out soon that Moses was not God, but the Lord in heaven was the true God. After he saw what God did to the land of Egypt because of his refusal to submit to God and let the children of Israel go, Pharaoh finally recognized who this Lord was. But the statement Jesus made, ye are gods, was deeper than simply acknowledging that the leaders were in a position of authority, but they would be judged by God because instead of defending the helpless and the needy, they used their position for, for gain because they were greedy. As it is stated in Psalms 82 verse 2, How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? And my friends, this is what we are plagued with today. Those who are in positions of authority and leadership, most of them have gone after the way of Baal, uh, the way of Balak, or Balaam, the prophet, for greed. God had established his leadership to judge and do justice among the people in his place. Calling them gods had nothing to do with them being divine. It had to do with them being divinely appointed. <clears throat> the Bible is clear, and we're going to read in Isaiah chapter 41 in a moment. The Bible is clear that anyone who acts like he is God or acts in the place of God or follows a false god is an abomination to God himself. This is why the Antichrist is tied to the abomination of desolation. Now I want you to learn this phrase. I want you to learn this title. Abomination of desolation. Say it again with me. Abomination of desolation. What is that? An abomination in the Bible is one of two things. An abomination is an image or an idol and something that God hates. So when you say abomination, in the Bible, context will tell you if it's referring to an idol, an image, or if it's referring to something that God hates. So the abomination of desolation is the image that the Antichrist will set in the third temple and he will require everyone on earth to worship it. This is the image, this image is called by God the abomination of desolation. Learn this phrase because it's coming soon. That is the statue or idol that will bring destruction. Abomination, the idol or statue of desolation that will bring destruction. And when the whole earth bows down before this idol, that's the strong delusion that God talks about in 2 Thessalonians. There is no greater delusion than thinking that this man or this image is God. The greatest lie to perpetrate upon man is believing in a false God. There is no greater lie than that. And Isaiah 41 calls those who choose false gods an abomination. Let me read you the passage. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Yea, do good or evil that we may be dismayed, and behold it together. Behold, ye are of nothing, and your work of naught. An abomination is he that chooseth you. In this passage, God is challenging, challenging those who call things or themselves gods. God issues the challenge. If you are gods, present your case. Tell us what will happen in the future. Uh, do things that only a god can do, so that we may be dismayed. Show us your power. And then God mocks them. God says, you are nothing. And he finally declares that anyone who chooses these so-called gods is an abomination to the only true God. So you have to be careful what you worship. Because if you worship a false god, God calls you an abomination. Now, this is how the devil was to, able to deceive Eve. He promised her divinity. In Genesis 3, 5, For God doth know, he says this to her, For God doth know, that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Did the devil lie to her? No, he did not. He told her that when you eat of the fruit, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like a god, knowing good and evil. And that's what happened. But what he didn't tell her is that God would judge her. This marked the beginning of the human guilty conscience, the awareness of good and evil, right and wrong. It gave man the ability of self-judgment, 
a godlike ability which we pass on to our children. When Jesus said to the Jews, you are gods, he was saying more than you are in the place of judging on behalf of God. He was also insinuating that they had the ability to judge uh, right from wrong, good from evil. Man is depraved in the sense that he is inclined by nature to serve his own will and desires and rejects God's rule and not that he is completely incapable of good. The, scripture, the scriptures attest that man is capable of good. Luke 6.45 A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil for, the, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Being good is a choice Likewise, being evil is a choice. This does not imply that man is sinless. Man cannot save himself. It does not mean that man does not have any good in him. Even the evil men bring give good gifts to their children. So we have to be careful how we interpret scripture. Today, men reject Christ by choice. When you hear with your ears that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God sent to take away your sins and the sins of the world. You have a choice to make. You either believe this statement that I am telling you here this morning that you are hearing clearly in your ears or reject it. If you reject it, then the Bible is clear. Hell is your final destination. The wrath of God will follow you to your death. The Bible is clear, unambiguous. Jesus himself said he was the Messiah. You have a choice to make. Either believe his claim that he was the Messiah or accept the fact, the false fact, that he was a big, fat liar. And those of us who believe him to be the Messiah are deceived and deluded. That's the only conclusion you can come up with. You cannot say with one mouth, with, with the both sides of your mouth, oh, Jesus was a good man. I get he was lying about him being the Messiah or the Son of God. It cannot be. Those things do not go together. They, the logic doesn't hold. Today, God is clear, and God tells us that we are God's. And there are only two ways you can be a so-called God. When you stand in the place of authority that God has ordained you to be, we are gods or you are a God in the sense that you represent him. And the other is when we believe Satan's lie and become, as he said, gods. You will either represent God with a capital G or you will either represent yourself a God with a small g. In Genesis 3.22, God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. There is a trinity right there. The man has become as one of us to know good and evil. We are like God in the sense that we know right from wrong. And as a God, we also have the ability to judge right from wrong. But because we are not God, our judgment is often tainted with our own desires and lusts. And that's the problem. You will live life one of two ways. And this also applies to the Christian this morning. You can make your God, you can make God your God, or you can make yourself God with a small g. Every time you make a decision contrary to the will of God, you are making yourself God with a small g. Because you are deciding for yourself without consulting God. That's, that's how it is, black and white. I can't sugarcoat it. Every time you do something outside the will of God, you are acting like a God. Satan promised Eve that she would be like God. It was a half-truth. She was like God in the sense that she could identify good and evil. She was not God because she could not make herself do right all the time. And that is, that is why she chose to disobey. And Adam wasn't far behind, lest we put the blame entirely on Eve. The problem with men is that they act like little gods walking on the earth. Whenever you feel like you're in charge, you're acting like a little god. Whenever you plan your future on your own, you're acting like a little God. Whenever you ignore God and His precepts, you're acting like a little God. Man's pride believes his own lies because he does not want God. Rather, he wants to be God. And that's the struggle everyone has. Whether you're lost or saved, who's going to be your God? The God of heaven or you? God does not want us to be a God, small g. He wants to be our God. And when God is truly your God, you will live as an extension of who He is. In John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. 
When you look at a tree, you can distinguish between the, tr between the roots and the trunk and the boughs and the branches and the leaves. They're distinct, but you can also tell that the whole entire thing is a tree. The branches are simply extensions of the tree. They are not the tree, but they are an indivisible part of the tree. Likewise, we have to be so in God that we become His branches. Separate, yet indivisible. It is God's desire that we live like we are His sons and not as gods with a small g. In John 1.12, the Bible says, But as many as received it, to them He gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, one of the greatest verses regarding the new nature, he says, Whereby are given us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Partaker. You and I, the moment we receive Christ as our Savior, we become a partaker of the divine nature. That means we become an extension of God, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. When we live apart from God, we quit being an extension of God and instead become a God with a little g, ruling our own lives. In John 15, 6, Jesus says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. A missionary in Africa several decades ago lived in a small hut, which was electrically supplied by a quiet, small generator. The little gas generator powered, uh, gave power and supplied current both for his home and the primitive church building beside his house. Late one afternoon, two African men from another much more remote village visited the pastor in his hut, and they were amazed when night fell. He simply switched uh, on uh, the, the light switch and lights uh, lit the room. They were wide-eyed at the electric light bulb hanging from the ceiling of his living space. One of the visitors asked the pastor if he could have one of the bulbs, thinking perhaps he wanted it for a short trinket. The pastor obliged and gave it to him. Months passed. <clears throat> On his next visit to the remote village uh, of that same man who received the light bulb from the pastor, the pastor stopped at the hut of that man uh, who had asked for the light bulb. Imagine his surprise when he saw the bulb hanging from an ordinary string. The man understood the general idea of connection, but he didn't understand empowering. Lots of believers today are like that. We understand that Christ is divine. We understand that we are the branches, but they are not empowered by that. Many of us think that Jesus was using the vine as, a, as an illustration. We imagine Jesus is walking through a vineyard and says, you know what, today I think I'm going to use the vine to uh, teach my disciples a thing or two. But he wasn't using the vine as an illustration. He was doing more than that. He never said, I am like the vine. He never compared himself to the vine. What did he say? I am the vine. He also didn't say I am the vine or that he is one of many vines. He said, I am the true vine, the one and only vine. In the Old Testament, uh, if, you, if you want to understand the depth of, of this illustration, you need to understand typology in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Israel was, was likened to a vine. And Jesus uh, uses this metaphor to drive home, uh, uh, to drive the point home that he is the true vine. In Psalms chapter 80, verse 8, the psalmist writes, Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt, thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Israel lived a few hundred years as bond servants in the land of Egypt, and they became almost one with the Egyptians. Then God snipped that vine and brought it into the land of Canaan and planted it uh, with, and gave it special care and attention. The problem is that the Jews in the land, promised land, they couldn't keep God as their God and eventually follow false gods. And therefore God withdrew his protection from them and allowed them to be invaded and, ca and taken captive by the heathen nations round about them. And in Isaiah chapter 5 verse 4, God laments and he says, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Today we're excited because we finally planted a few grapes last year. 
and we have uh, three small bunches, just a handful of grapes on each one, and we're all excited, but we know from past history that if we do not cover these with a net, the birds will eat them before we get a chance to eat them. Uh, I don't know why I told you that, but uh, Israel is likened unto a vine. Despite all of God's attention and care upon this vine, the children of Israel did not yield unto him the fruit he desired. So God decided to start all over again with a different vine, with a different shoot, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In Psalms 80 verse 19, the Psalms laments and he says, Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts, cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. And that did happen. God eventually brought forth a true vine. In Matthew 121 it says, Answering the psalmist's prayer and call, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people, that is the Jews, from their sins. The psalmist lamented, Save us, turn to us, O God, and save us. And God says, Yes, I will. I will bring forth my son, the Messiah, and he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus is the beginning of the whole new planting by the Lord God. Jesus is the one who will give to God the harvest that he did not, get, that he did not receive from the nation of Israel. Jesus is of Israel, and he is more than Israel. So when Jesus said, I am the true vine, this statement was scandalous and surprising to the Jews because they knew they were the vine. So now he was usurping their national identity by calling himself the true vine. Now they understood full well what he was saying. He was saying he was the faithful and true Israel. For the people of Israel failed to produce the fruit that God required of them, Jesus would now succeed. You know the, the, the charge that Israel had? They were supposed to be an obedient people to God, and God would bless them so richly that the surrounding nations and the nations of the whole world would see the blessings of God upon Israel, and they would come to Israel seeking the God of Israel. That was God's plan, but it didn't happen. It will happen in the Millennial Kingdom, but that was God's original plan for the nation of Israel. They bungled their mission to be a blessing to the nations of the world. But Jesus says he's going to get the job done. As people, we sometimes live our lives as we are totally independent vines. We think that we can please God with our own strength and abilities and effort. But we are not independent vines. We are only branches of the true vine. And the most important thing that a branch can do is stay connected with the vine. What happens when you prune a branch or a vine from a tree? It withers and dies. Only a branch that is connected and attached can receive the life-giving sap that flows from the vine itself. In reality, we can do a lot apart from the vine. We can get an education. <clears throat> we can have a career. We can start a business. We can raise families. We can preach a sermon. We can make millions of dollars. We can climb Mount Everest. We can put a man on the moon. We can do all these things in our own capacity. And it all can go very well. There's a lot of lost people who are successful. A lot of people who do not believe in God have achieved great things. Atheists are productive members of society. But the truth is, apart from the vine, we will never produce the fruit that God seeks and desires. That is the key a lot of people are missing. God desires His branches to produce fruit. A number of years ago, the Associated Press released a study done by an, agri an agricultural school in Iowa it reported that the production of 100 bushels of corn from one acre of land, in addition to many hours of a farmer's labor, required the following. 4 million pounds of water, 1,600 pounds of oxygen, 5,200 pounds of carbon, 160 pounds of nitrogen, 125 pounds of potassium, 70 pounds of sulfur, and other elements too numerous to list. In addition to these things, which no man can produce, the crop required rain and sunshine at the right and most critical times of its growth. They estimated that only 5% of the produce of farm can be attributed to the efforts of man. Only 5%. The remaining has to do with the elements around it. With the rain and the sun that can only come from God. If we were honest, we have to admit that the same is true in producing spiritual fruit. Jesus makes it clear that we can't produce any fruit on our own. 
When we disconnect from the vine, we wither and we die spiritually. When we disconnect from the vine, we are like little gods walking around, strutting our stuff, thinking that we are something when we are nothing. We can never please God until we utterly depend on Jesus Christ himself. We are nothing on our own, but in his will and by his authority, we are instruments for his purposes. Jesus looks at humanity today and says, ye are gods. And you have a choice to make. You can abide in the vine and bear much fruit. For he says, without him you can do nothing. The choice is ours to make. The benefits are abiding are supernatural joy and peace, answered prayer, and fruit bearing. Everyone has a choice to make this morning and every day of your life. You can either walk around as God as your God, or you can walk around as you as God. As a little God walking around trying to make things on your own. Trying to make things happen. Never really being satisfied deep down inside. What will it be for you this morning, O oh Christian? Will you make God your God? Will you make sure that He is God over every area, over every area of your life? Or you will still hang on to your status as a little God. The choice is yours. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this message. Father, you tell us that we are gods with a small g. And that is the truth. You told us that we would become like you, knowing good from evil the moment we partook of that fruit. Even though we were not those who ate the fruit, but the consequences of our first parents did has been passed down from generation to generation to each and every one of us. We're all connected through Adam and Eve. Help us not be little gods walking around, strutting our stuff. Help us be as, as branches, as part of the vine, making you our God, connecting with you, Lord God, becoming extensions of you in every, in every area of our lives. I know, Father, you gave us some liberty in some areas of our lives, but in, in overall, you want to be our God in everything that we do, in our jobs, in our homes, in our church, in our schools, in our businesses, in our personal life. You want to be our God. Help us. Help us to make you our God in every area of our life. And help us not to hang on to this room or that room or this place or that place or this area as a little God. I pray, Father, you open the hearts and the minds of your people this morning that they may understand what you expect from them. You want us to be, you want to be our God. And help us. Give us the strength to allow you to take this place, which is rightfully yours. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to you. Help us.